and uh, then we move on to what, uh, like what's the most value happen in some places that then just decided to just listen to us. Sure. Uh, so my name is Fred. I've been a VC forever. Um, actually, we just uh, got scooped by TechCrunch last night, so we uh, apparently have closed a 40 million pounds for new seed fund based in the UK. And my partner is uh, Harry Stebbing to the 20 minute VC podcast. So, first time funding partner of the fund. Correct. So, you basically have a kind of Battle Harvard veteran and a 21 year old podcaster, uh, which we're hoping that kind of makeup will uh, lead to some interesting outcomes. So, who's coming out with the 20 minute VC podcast? All right, that's what we like to hear. So, yeah, so Harry is my partner. He's awesome. And, and prior to that, you know, is does we like sell? Um, I've actually done mostly consumers, so Zoopla, Deliveroo, Secret Escape, Skywalk, but then a number of things that touch on hardware, like the Wood, <coughs> which is a on-grade sensor, and the Goa, which is real-time rendering in the browser, um, for CAD, and so it used to be in Boston as well. So, actually, just to, to, uh, to let you know, uh, this is not about speed focus on hardware, it's about exits in general, so I feel free to. Tony, you're a kind of mysterious guy, right? <laughs> like, you're yeah, hard to Google, it's hard to find things about you, but then when I talk to people, it's like, oh, this guy Tony, he's done so many things, he's like IPO companies, soft companies, bad companies, seems like he's done like a million things. Um, so, who are you? <laughs> Um, it's a great advantage of being short. You can just hide under the, uh, under the radar. Under the radar. It's always tall people, they look at And you know, we're Fred here, and it's like uh, we had the internet 1.0, and then we had 2.0, and then 3.0. Fred, you're a 3.0 adventure park. In fact, you're probably 4.0. You have been forever. Community fuels for the DC fund. That's a fascinating experience. Been through a few funding rounds and, and had the privilege of growing up a few businesses and selling them. How did you get started in tech? Like, you, so because of, you were a cocktail guy, so what was the path? So, so, so what do you do now? Yeah, so, so the path is very simple. Um, and, and you hear this story from a lot of people. Um, I'm severely dyslexic, slightly autistic, and somewhere on the Asperger scale. So me and school didn't work at all. Um, so I left school at 16 with no qualifications. And today, one of my proudest things is I don't have an English O level. Absolutely not. So I have virtually no qualifications. I don't know if you don't know what that means, but. <laughs> 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 if, if, if I came to the UK, they wouldn't let me in. Oh, uh, okay. No, okay, you're not, you're not, uh, you can't get a visa to your no, country. No, I wouldn't get a visa to my country. Happy that. Um, the, the advantage of that is that. Unlike many people who are um, who do well at school, their, their parents and their community say, oh, look, what you do is you go first and find a job, then you buy a house, then you get married, then you have kids, then you do da, 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 and you follow this very traditional path. When you have no qualifications, nobody's going to give you a job. Construction. So you've got the choice of you either build your own computer, because that's the choice, or you don't. And so what I did, I constructed. <laughs> so I, I set it up and ran into this program called TCPIP. And uh, we built a business back in 1990 based on TCPIP, and then thankfully the work happened in, in the 92 and the 93, and as they say, the rest is history. So. Okay, so let's now move on to the, um, the topic at hand, which is startups and exits. Uh, Fred, um, so you've been busy for a while, uh, been busy for close to five years, and because we do really early stage, I uh, actually don't have any exits to talk about. Uh, but you've been here for longer, uh, you've seen some exits, so can you tell us a bit what kind of exits you, you have in your portfolio so far? Um, I mean, I can, talk about, about, I can talk about the exits, so maybe take a step back. Um, when you write the first check in a company, um, actually there's three things you're trying to get right. One is, can you own enough? Number two is, can you be valuable enough? And number three is, does anybody have a real reason to buy? Now, on occasion, you need to take a company IPO. I did that with Zoopla. But most of the time, that's not what's going to happen. So when you look at a company, you're sort of trying to project yourself five to seven years out, and you live in the chaos of the other state where the data is not predictive. It's very, um, very difficult, actually. You have to make, constantly make decisions in, the, in an environment of scarcity of data. But you're always projecting out and saying, 
is there a particular reason, is there a point in time when that company absolutely needs to be bought by somebody? And when it does, can it be bought for a lot of money? Uh, and it sounds, I'm making it sound simple on purpose because to some extent it is, right? And the biggest problem for European venture is uh, everybody sort of looks good on paper, but very few people have actually exited companies in return cash. Um, and one of the reasons for that is you, know, you can spend 8, 10, 12 years building a business and then find yourself in a market where the margins are compressed, uh, where you go off growth at some point, so growing 70% growth, you go 25, then you go 5. And suddenly you're a company that nobody really needs to acquire. And you can sort of keep going, but you know, the, the uh, notion of generating an exit becomes extremely hard. And so I always think from day one, I'm sort of obsessed about, you know, can we build a real category leader? So the category, by the way, can be narrow, right? So Zoopla, uh, which I seeded and actually was uh, only recently was for to IPO, Zoopla is in a narrow category. It's basically in the UK online real estate only, right? It's a single market. Single vertical play, but you know, we just got both for $3 billion uh, two weeks ago. Um, but it dominated, it actually wasn't even number one, it was number two in this category, but in a category that was highly simple to both the um, And so I'm constantly looking for, you know, can you make a dent in the category you're going after, whichever way you define that problem. Because that sort of provides you a baseline of I'm valuable, number one, and number two, somebody at some point is going to need to buy me. And then the next thing I look at is I hate replacing founders with a passion. So I'm sort of looking at the man or woman in the room in front of me and sort of thinking, okay, if they were in the room with Jeff Bezos in seven years' time and they have to negotiate their exit, um, you know, how do you fare? Right? So if you can be a young engineer, it doesn't matter, but do you have that sort of mental in you that says that when the day comes, you can negotiate an exit properly? Because I can tell you what happens when you negotiate things. When we did the daily bush transition, which was a particularly great one, so 200 million bucks in a bit of a large process. But you have 14 people on the other side of the table, like literally, right? So MA, strategy, finance, and then they're on Messenger with another team that's back home, and they're negotiating against you. And that's you, and that gives me the CEO and the lawyer, right? And if your CEO is capable of holding <coughs> his head, you know, what's happening in the room and kind of keeping, uh, keeping the core where it should be, it gets tough, right? And that's how you get screwed on negotiations and exits. And so we're looking for people who can kind of take that kind of pain and that kind of pressure when the moment comes. And they're hard to find, right? So that's kind of how I think about it. Yeah. Tommy. Faster, faster. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll, 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 I suppose the thing on that is that when companies um, tend to turn up, um, they fall into the categories of, 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 of three. Uh, first category um, is the absolute bedrock of the UK economy. They're a small business, they're going to trade, they're going to be worth a million, two million, happy days, you wish the people extremely well, you encourage them, you build them, you might actually point them towards other ways of funding, um, but whatever you do, you don't say no, we get a lot of because they're the basis of actually getting experience in so they can come back. Uh, the second bunch you turn up, are people can grow companies to you know, 25, 30, 40, 50 million. They're absolutely solid companies. But they, the reality is they're not equity fundable for, for exactly the three reasons you said. It's just like, but they're useful. And it's finding mechanisms to encourage them. And, you know, having Crowdcube here, some of this stuff is brilliant because some of the stuff that goes on today is exactly number one and number two. They're brilliant businesses, and they will deliver a return, but not in the numbers which make sense based on uh, Number three, unfortunately, are far too rare. Um, we have a, a bit of a process that we have sort of adopted a lot, but it's a term at a time, um, and it sounds quite brutal. But and it, it lives to this point about finding teams who don't need mentoring, coaching, training, or anything else to keep growing. There just isn't enough time. And to look at the person in the eyes and work out if they can do it is really hard. So we have a two-weekly iteration cycle where you have to deliver. And if you don't deliver every two weeks, you're asked to leave. And the reason you're asked to leave is not because you're not competent or capable or anything else. It's because you're actually not growing at the rate to hit the numbers. And you can do it every two weeks. And then we have a this very different type of process to do that filter. And allow the, the filter to be based on evidence as opposed to gut feeling, which is... Which is so you're judging the investments on basically 
the months of growth target that you discuss with the founders and they didn't reach that, you didn't have a good story for it. it even worse than that, um, they set their own, their own, as we call it, achievement. What they're going to achieve in two weeks. And we're not bothered about the delta between what you say you're going to achieve and you do achieve, it's you achieve. And it's when the achievements stop and you start getting down from 25, you know, 75, 25 to 5, you know, and actually you can see it very quickly in an early stage conflict where the energy, the tenacity, things go wrong and they, they fade very quickly, and that's the process that we're trying to sort them out. Um, exits, yeah, we're going to talk about that in the next bit, I think. So. Yeah, so, um, okay, this is kind of interesting that basically you guys look at the end, I mean, as investors, because that's kind of your job to look at the end game. Um, you look at that quite try to think of it very clearly from the beginning. Basically, can it can it be about uh, how the fund is able to execute uh, the delivery? Um, and uh, so, Fred, from what you said, it sounded like mostly you were thinking about can we sell this to a company? Is IPO something we're on the now? Um, generally, or yeah, does I mean, it matter? Or it, it's it, like it's the general idea is the, the fallback plan is the it, 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 it's the dream, right? So what I in a way, what I was trying to describe is the schizophrenia of the venture capitalists. So, I didn't know, so if I think about Zoomla, we had five people, right? We never wrote business, uh, business budgets beyond three months for about two and a half years. So we were iterating on three months budgets really fast because we didn't think it had made any sense to try to predict the future. Right? Like it was just pointless. So we're like in, executing super fast cycles, spending no money, you know, building with, with very few high quality people. And then the schizophrenia comes in because at some point you want to shift your mindset and say, oh, actually, now is the time when we want to completely change the game that we're playing and kind of go for that, for that big outcome. And so for me, at the beginning, it's more like, okay, you know, I know the path is going to be completely unpredictable. And, you know, at some point, you're going to have to be patient, you're going to be frustrated, you're going to lose some of the key people, the market's going to move against you. And so, the way to work through that is to have people with the grits and then knowing that at the end of the rainbow is a vision that's worth achieving. And the dream is always to go public. And in fact, the dream is to build companies that are so big and nobody can buy it, right? Like, um, if you're the deliverable today, I'm like, I'm not sure who buys deliverable. And there's very, very few buyers, you can count them on one hand, right? Because that's a company that's already at a scale where it's like, you know, and there's no logical acquirer anymore. I mean, a few, but not that many. Um, or you build, you have Delpac, this company I've had in the online pharmacy space in the US. It's a very, very unique model for um, people who live with complex conditions, and they're replacing the whole pharmacy. Uh, so, the soup and nuts, the whole pharmacy operating system, uh, supply and delivery, and, and relationship with the client. That's the kind of company where, I mean, there are 30 million patients in the target group. If we are 250,000 patients, we're going to be making like, 500 million dollars a year. So this is one of those where the market opportunities in there. And of course the game is to go all the way, and it's what we dream of. But at the same time, you know, Amazon announces they're moving into pharmacy. You know, Walmart acquires Jet. And Mars Laura Jet so the super competition, consolidation, market exchange. It's not even I think that we could stick to our path with that company, just execute on what we do, because to some extent Amazon's not gonna be in our space for ten years. You know, we're such a uh, such a we have to think about robots. I mean, so all our processes are uh, so specific that the expertise we built really. What's interesting though is that, oh, this is an inflection point in the market where the big ships are going in. And so you sort of have to think like, all right, so I can raise another three to 500 million, right? Go all the way. Because I mean, with a company at that scale, with the sort of logistics they have, et cetera, that's what it's going to take. Or there's an inflection point where the market's starting to look at you going, all right, you're a strategic asset. You know, what do what we do? And I think for you to have awareness of how your market is working, it's really important. It's, it's interesting because it's a token of inflection from Sinensity, and I read your mind when I wrote it there. Um, and, uh, but that actually came from a panel we had in Paris a few months ago. And one, a couple of things were mentioned. One, one was talking about the, that as a CEO, you have to have kind of a sense of the asymptotes. Which is the real market potential, not the thing you write on the pitch deck and feel like, oh, we might do that, but the thing that you feel that this is actually the real hard limit for your business. 
And as you're getting close to it, so as you're mentioning, like, the beginning you grow really fast, and then the growth slows down, and then right here. Um, there's this kind of reflection point where growth starts to slow down, and is that, like, that's possibly also one of the timings for an exit, um, so that's really important here, which means in that case you prepared earlier. Um, is that some also the consideration uh, as, as a VC to look at companies and talk to them, uh, sometimes as a board member, sometimes just as an investor, uh, telling them, hey, uh, it looks like it's slowing down, maybe we should kind of look at options. All right, so I'm going to take a maybe a slightly contrarian view to that. If you have a company that's doing well and it's inflecting, they tend to be able to go way further than you think. But when you have one of those, freaking like stay on board. And it's a good traders, actually good traders are people you can learn a lot from because they know how to make money. Traders always get their losses early and double down on their winners. And most humans do the opposite. When you're losing, you're like, I'll, I'll make it back. And when you make money, you're like, shit, I'm going to take it off the table. And it's just sort of the opposite you need to do. What's more interesting to me is that sort of, um, you can think of option trees, and at every point of the journey, there's always a decision that says, I'm going to raise another 10 or 20 or whatever, or I, this may be a, a jump of point that's not. I think what you're describing here, the issue I have with it, is you're already trying to sell you know, an aging dog that's like, and you know, the buyers are getting smart, right? So you're going to see through that. What's interesting is you're now at 50 million of value or 75 million of value, whatever number, and then you're saying, okay, the next stage in my evolution requires our customer support at scale, sales at scale, you know, ops at scale, and you're looking at the execution path in front of you, and you say, and you know, if I plug my product into the channels of an existing mm -hmm. water, I might be a lot more valuable to them. Than so, so what you're talking about is essentially this is kind of the asymptote you might reach just on your own, but if you change something because suddenly you're much more capitalized, or you're going to some some distribution of partnerships, right. maybe you can inflect it again. Correct. So, on that note, sometimes you see companies that are doing 10 million in revenue, so let's say, and they get bought for 500. And the whole market thinks, oh my god, the acquirer is an idiot. Like, how could they pay that much to pay 50 times revenue? Actually, they're not idiots at all. They took your product, we had this with an Excel accelerator in Boston that we sold to, to IBM. But basically, they looked at it and like, okay, if we plug this through our channels, this is going to be a significant revenue business for us. And I think they made Two million dollars in top line to the other company. So very often, your perception of your own value versus what you're actually worth to the market is quite different. So yeah, so that your own assumptions on your own is not the same as the market for the buyer. Actually, that we we went part of that discussion uh, earlier this evening uh, with uh, Frederick from uh, talking about his experience at Cisco. But for Cisco, in a way, it doesn't really matter that much how much money you make. What matters is can they put that to their sales goals? Um, can the business Get that business like crazy because it plugs into what they're already saying. Um, so that's uh, I guess that's kind of the idea. So, so, so any points in that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take exactly the same graph and just change the axis. Um, so, so on the, the um, x-axis up here, instead of growth, I'd stick a ubiquity. And right down the bottom is new and novel, and at the top is commodity. Um, everybody's got it. And on the other axis, I'd go on certainty. And you go from zero certainty at the, the, the cross, all the way to completely certain. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when you reach up an asymptote at the top here, you've got a completely certain quantity because your ubiquity is high, certainty is high, which is utility. Okay, right down the bottom here. Low margin type of thing. It doesn't have to be low margin, but it's a, it's a margin you understand. And right down the bottom here, you've got innovation and novelty. And then between them, you've got um, growth and transition, and then uh, effectively processes. And if you look at the company, which is to your very point, which is when you're new, everything is new and novel. And you run out of headless chickens and we've all done it. The second one is everything becomes bespoke. You've got one process to do one thing. Then you start to hit actually processes and you bring processes and data and everything else to bear. And when you're at the top, you're a Six Sigma. And this is the, the very point. Because when you're selling to a Six Sigma business, they look at yours going, I understand how to run your business well. And it's being able to get your business to a sufficient level away from bespoke to transition where they can actually convert it. Because if they can't convert, you're absolutely a one-off bespoke, 
you won't get that, that, that piece off. You end up just doing everything So what you're saying is that being in the top right of your model is actually not a bad thing. It's okay. just a very predictable, runnable, stable, potentially defensible, high margin business. But the, most of the businesses you're going to exit to will be already there. What they're looking to do is bring another business into their portfolio for that growth. And if you actually end up right at the top and that's a commodity, you've got the very problem Fred described earlier, which is there's nobody left to buy you because you've passed that point. So it's, when I look at the inflection point, it's between when you're going this slow to transition because they're really important points in your growth. And it's not, it's about a stage of growth and a stage of maturity. You also yeah, so I, um, as I've listened to Total, you know, which is absolutely right about complementary products. What I have an opinion. So I have, a, I always have a problem with conceptual frameworks that you're trying to fit everything in. I mean, they're really, really hard to design. There's actually very few that fly. So if you look at hardware, right? Just to bring it back to how many people are hardware improvements? Right. So I, this VC 101 for hardware. Category one. Um, Big engineering plays that attack fundamental issues like storage, uh, you know, uh, deep learning computer chips, like whatever it is, right? Batteries, uh, desktop metal, if you think about 3D metal. Right? So these things typically are attack new categories, they're hugely capital intensive to build. You tend to assemble teams of 60 to 80 PhDs and solving very, very hard for science for engineering. Science. Science. Then you have number two, which is, okay, uh, consumer driven. Now, I'm going to attack preferably a legacy industry where everybody's quite sleepy. Good example, temperature controls. And you know, they don't know how to design. Um, and they, don't, they don't know how to design well, they don't move fast enough, they don't understand the consumer, they're stuck in ancient value chains. So you build Next, or you build Rain, or you build in completely new categories like Fitbit. And then to the extent you can, you need to run this as fast, as, as far as you can, fast, before products get copied. And of course, products get copied faster and faster, so your initial margin gets eaten up in the terms mm -hmm. to solve that working capital, channel to market, etc. Quickly enough that you build a great brand, sell it for a couple of billion before you know uh, Asian manufacturers start pushing their own brands or partial except or whatever, and they start having real competition in the market. And so that category too uh, typically gets done really well in Silicon Valley. It's like really hard to do in us, uh, even though we're expecting some uh, good ones to come out of China. And then sort of category three is probably the world most of you live in, which is, okay, we have standards, we have cheap components, and now we're in the world of IoT, sensors, you know, cheap, ubiquitous uh, hardware devices you can put in the environment. Then the question there is, okay, can I please stay out of the migration path of the big monsters? Because the issue we have with Amazon and the like is they're way better than any companies we've ever seen historically. So then it's a question of, can I open new verticals? For example, can I build robots that move plants around in the nursery? Okay, nobody in the right mind is going to develop robots that move plants around in the nursery for the next few years because it's a sleepy industry. Turns out it's massive. You're going to harvest strawberries. Um, or uh, you basically you start to attack.